Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'll get started. Um, so I worked on firmware doubling for past four to five years. It's been slowly improving. Um, so I thought, and I've been giving like quick lightning 10 minute talks for the, in the past LPCs. And this is kind of almost like a summary of what's all been done, what you can start using it for now, and um, what you can do going forward to make good use of it, and what are some to-dos that are still left. Uh, so to give a quick, okay there, to give a quick introduction, on a typical SOC, you have a bunch of IP blocks in the SOC, you know, so I'm just a random bunch of examples. And they depend on each other. There are a lot of dependencies between each of the devices. So like say the display might depend on the multimedia clocks, you know, uh, depending on that. Multimedia clocks might depend on the PIMIC or other clocks, a bunch of dependencies. In the real world example, it's way more crazier than this. And, and if you look at device tree, so right now firmware doubling only supports device trees, but it's written in a way where it could be uh, you could add support for ACPI if somebody's interested in it. I don't have enough familiarity to do that. Um, and in a, in a device tree, you know, you have a bunch of device tree nodes. It's like a hierarchical tree, too. And each device tree node will point to some other device tree node as a supplier. So you have like clocks, for example, interrupts, pin control, files. They're pointing to other device nodes and saying, hey, I need this resource from this device node and I'm going, I might use it. So that's what the device trees are kind of explaining or defining. Uh, what firmware dev link does is basically, uh, to give a quick overview on that, it parses the device tree to determine the, the dependencies between each of those nodes, between the device tree nodes. Um, and it's intentionally designed and implemented in a way where it is, uh, it does not depend on drivers for correctness. That's like one of the main goals of it, too, because it needs to work for a fully modular kernel, too. And um, right now it supports about 33 different uh, DT properties that it understands, you know, and parses and understands them. And so at one stage we, we par parse the DT nodes and we create consumer supplier dependency tracking using what we call a firmware node links that's between the device tree, uh, tree nodes. And then as those device tree nodes get converted into struct devices, we create, we convert these firmware node links into device links. That's kind of the high level overview of uh, what firmware dev link does. Um, so what are the new features or uh, abilities we have on the Linux kernel now that we have firmware dev link? Um, so before I get into that, firmware dev link has been enabled by default in the kernel for a couple of years now. Um, so one of the main benefits with firmware dev link is you no longer have to play init call chicken. Your init call level has no implications on what order you probe compared to your supplier. Uh, firmware dev link guarantees that your supplier will probe before the consumer. And um, we don't need any special handling for optional suppliers. Firmware DevLink will try its best to enforce ordering at some point if it realizes there are no more drivers going to be loaded, it'll kind of relax it. I'll get to that later. Um, and if you're, uh, yeah, if, if your if supplier doesn't have a pro, yeah. Long story short, you don't have to play init call chicken. You can stop worrying about your init call levels. It'll just work. Um, Another change that was done as part of this effort was to kind of make the deferred probe time out a little bit smarter. So it used to be that at late init call, you start a timer, it expires, and that's kind of considered the end of deferred probe attempts. After that, you will no longer defer a probe waiting for a supplier. You'll just fail. If it's an optional supplier, you'll probe without it. If it's a mandatory supplier, you'll just fail probing. Um, but you want to kind of make it more usable for modular uh, kernels too. So at late init call, we start the deferred probe timer. So in this example, let's say you have a 10 second deferred probe timer, that's a default value. We started at late init call, as long as new drivers keep getting registered before the timer expires, we keep extending the timer again. We start it again at the current point in time and wait for another 10 seconds before we give up. 
And once the timer expires, we do a bunch of stuff. I'll get to that later. But once the timer expires, if a new driver registers itself, nothing different is done for it. It's considered like, at that point, you don't wait for any deferred probe. Um, and then with firmware DevLink, we're also a lot smarter about how we give up on suppliers. So let's look at this example. Let's say the deferred probe list uh, is in the order of D, C, B, and A. Right? Those are four devices that need to get probed. Um, at the, say at the end of a late internet call, for example. Um, the orange box means that device has no driver in the system. And we have arrows uh, denoting um, the consumer is pointing to the supplier. Dashed arrows mean it's an optional supplier. Solid arrows is a mandatory supplier. So without firmware devlink, the order in which those devices would have been attempted after the uh, deferred probe timeout expires is you try D, D will fail to probe because it's mandatory consumer C hasn't been probed yet. C will probe with partial functionality because B is not probed yet. B will probe with partial functionality because A isn't probed yet. And A never probes because it doesn't have a driver. But with firmware devlink, now that we have firmware devlink, we'll actually make sure B probes first because, I mean, A is in there, we give up on that. B probes first with partial functionality. C will actually succeed to probe with full functionality, and D will also probe with full functionality. So overall, the system is in a way more functional state with firmware doubling, <coughs> e even with deferred probe timeout giving up on optional suppliers. By the way, feel free to interrupt me at any time. This is more of like, hey, community, this is what's going on. Try to use it better. Um, I can end the slides at any point in time. I don't think I need to go till the end. And then firmware devlink RPM is the default mode now. That basically means in addition to enforcing probe and suspend ordering, we also ensure runtime PM ordering. So you're, if, you're, if you haven't done runtime PM before, if it, if it has stability issues, give it a shot again. It's probably way more stable now because of this ordering enforcement. So which means if you wake up your consumer a device, you'll wake up the suppliers before you wake up the consumer. That kind of guarantee is there now. <coughs> um, another important benefit is that asynchronous probing is way more reliable now. Before, if you tried it, it's you will have a lot of issues. Uh, we have like zero issues when we do asynchronous probing in a Pixel 6, for example. And you get faster boot time, too. Uh, There's something else on my screen where I can't point it, so let me try to hide that. Uh, Kate? Oh. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll work with it. Um, anyway, so what you see up here uh, in, this, in the screenshots, time goes from left to right, and the two different configurations. The first one is uh, synchronous probing, and within these uh, screenshots, each of those rows corresponds to a CPU. And the darker the color, the more busy the CPU is. Um, so it, as you can see here in this region, all the devices are getting probed. But the work is kind of spread out across the time, and not all CPUs are busy. And that takes about uh, 900 milliseconds on a Pixel 6. And if you set all devices, all the drivers to do asynchronous probing, the time shrinks to 450 milliseconds. And you'll see the CPUs are way more busy in a shorter period of time. So your probing time gets cut down by half. Um, huh? Go ahead. Maybe someone can give him the mic. It's a short question. Does it affect the manual InSmart 2 if I have this kernel command line? Uh, yes. Question. Repeat the question. Yeah, yeah the question was, uh, will this affect uh, modules that are InSmarted to if this parameter is set, if this command line is set? Answer is yes. I was right there. I think it's, I think it's another question. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so one of the things that changed along with this is before it used to be that you cannot say a wildcard to say make every driver async probably, but now you can. So if you give a star, it means everything is asynchronous probe. And then you can give exceptions saying do asynchronous probing for all the drivers except drivers A, B, and C. 
That's the new syntax. If we don't give the star and you just give driver A, B, and C, then it means do asynchronous probing only for those drivers. So you have an easier way of enabling asynchronous probing by default. Um, but it gets even better because we no longer care about init call levels or module init ordering. None of that matters for correctness. Uh, we can actually do parallelized module loading too. Uh, so now the top chart is asynchronous probing. And the bottom chart is you're taking a fully modular kernel and you're loading all the modules in parallel. So not only do you probe in parallel, you're also doing the jump tables, uh, the, the PLT updates, all of those things are happening in parallel. You're loading the modules in parallel. So a lot more work, again, gets done in a much shorter period of time. You'll see the CPU is way more busy in that time period. So the whole module loading and probing, everything gets shrunk from 450 micros milliseconds to about 250 milliseconds. So you have gone all the way from 900 and something milliseconds to 250. So I'd encourage, again, people to try using uh, parallelized module loading. This needs user space support. I'm not too familiar with all the module loading options you have in user space and which one of them support parallelized module loading. But if you can do in smart or more probe in parallel, you should do that. Um, and yeah. In Android, we have this kernel command line if you add it on Android devices since Android 13. At least the first stage unit will do all the module loading in parallel if you set that command line. Um, so if you use Android, give it a shot. If you don't use Android, try to figure out how to do that in your system. It should make booting faster. Oh, and another benefit is, is again, asynchronous suspend resume is also a lot more stable because firmware dwelling creates device links and they enforce ordering, not only for probing, but for suspend resume, runtime PM, all those things. Um, so we have done this for uh, Pixel 6, and we didn't have to make any fixes to get it to work. It was working before, we just set asynchronous suspend resume for all the devices, and it just works. There's no command line option for this today, uh, but if you run this command on any system, it's basically looking through all the device folders and setting the async file to true. That's what it's trying to do. That's one way to enable asynchronous uh, probing for all the devices. Um, give it a shot, but there's some nuance to it. I talked about this in an earlier talk today. You can go look it up if you didn't attend that. As of how, as of right now, the way Suspend Resume is implemented, if you enable asynchronous Suspend Resume for all the devices, you end up doing more work than doing partial asynchronous Suspend Resume. So you need to be a little bit more smarter about which devices you select. So if you set, so if it's no asynchronous, it takes X amount of time. If you do all asynchronous, it's going to take X plus Y amount of time. But if you do partial asynchronous probing, then you'll have some time that's smaller than X. Um, another benefit that Firma DevLink uh, brings up, this is not something most people have to worry about, it's mostly a framework thing. Um, but the idea is if when you come out of reset, your boot order might leave some resources on before it jumps to the kernel. So for example, it might leave a power domain on because USB and display were turned on by the boot order and they're both running off of this particular power domain. So when you start probing the devices in the kernel, USB driver might come up and say, hey, turn on the power domain. It's already on, so you don't do anything. And then it might use the power domain, do whatever it needs to do, and might say, oh, I no longer need the power domain, turn it off. But if your framework actually turns it off, it's going to probably crash the device, or your display will start having garbled information, because you pretty much pull the power on the display while it's being active. So the goal is to give the display driver and device a chance to probe successfully and then put in their votes. So that's what the sync state callback is for. So if your device has a sync state callback, you'll get the callback after all your consumers have finished probing successfully. Um, so your, um, in your sync state callback, you can then say, OK, I know all my consumers have probed. I know all their votes now. Now I can enforce the request on hardware. <coughs> So if you implement a sync state uh, callback, your device will have a state sync file on your uh, SysFS path. Uh, actually, before I go into that, 
So the goal of sync state is to be correct first and then power optimal next. So you might have a case where you have a supplier, say again a power domain, and you might have like a case where you don't have a display driver, but you don't want the display to be garbled, it's just like say a boot splash screen, right? And uh, you might want to leave the hardware in that state and you may never have a display driver and you don't want to pull the power ever because that's going to crash your system. So if you don't have any, if one of the consumers doesn't probe, you'll never get the sync state call back and you'll never fully turn off the power domain. So functionally it's correct, you don't want to put your system in an sta unstable state. But in your system, he has a question back there. Can you pass yes. that? Continuous. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, to finish the sentence, but if you have an exception, the system, this file, you can actually echo a one into it saying, I know the consumers aren't done probing, but I also know they'll never probe, but it's okay to turn it off. So you can kind of echo one into it to forcefully do the state sync. So we have all these options, ignore clocks are news, ignore PD, power domains are news, ignore regulators Sorry, are can you, we don't need can, any I didn't understand your lock, can you say it slower? So we have all these options, ignore clocks unused, ignore power domains unused. We don't need any of that with this new FA Dev Link Sync State. If I actually finish my patch set, I sent out a patch set like a year or two years ago, and then Stephen had some valid points in it, and I have never had time to go up and clean it up. But once that's upstream, then you wouldn't have to worry about it. But default, they'll be kept on, if there's, and if that clock has no consumer, the clock controller, for the clock, It'll only work on a controller level, not per clock level. So it's going to be like a, because every clock doesn't have a device, so I can't track it per device. So that would be the first implementation when I get around to finishing it. Okay, thank you. Um, what else is there? Oh, and then if you want to have a timeout saying, in my system I know it's okay to power off, all the suppliers once default probe timeout expires, then you can just set from a dev link dot sync state equal to timeout. So that basically, once default probe timeout happens, it tries to probe as many devices as it can. At the end of it, it'll go say, okay, it doesn't matter whether all the consumers are probed or not, they're probably never gonna probe. It'll go call sync state for everybody. And you have a config option for it if you don't like a command line. Um, I think I covered all the points here. Um, and then dependence, uh, as part of this, I also added some uh, SysFS uh, nodes. So firmware dev link creates device links, but you can create device links using other means too. Your driver can create it, frameworks can create it. But you have a sys class dev link folder now that'll kinda have one folder for every single device link in your system of the format supplier dash dash consumer. And now you can kind of use that to figure out all the dependencies in the system. Because kind of looking at the device tree manually might be kind of confusing, especially if you have overlays and stuff. And we found this to be quite useful if we are working on upstreaming features or modularizing drivers. It kind of gives us an idea of which one to do first. Because you don't want to modularize a driver that's somewhere in the middle of a tree. You want to go from leaf towards the root. Um, but you, you can do that too, with firmware enabling it will work, but um, you know, not very useful, I think. Um, and then every device also has a supplier colon whatever name and consumer colon whatever name, symbolic links to these folders and sysclass dev links. So you can figure out all the suppliers and consumers of a given device. So it's, basically this information is available in sysfs now, you can use that. So that's all, all, those are all the things that work and we have now that firmware dev link is enabled by default. Uh, what else do we need to do to continue leveraging it correctly or what are things you need to fix or not to do or to do? That's what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, the first thing, the most important thing is firmware dev link is please follow the device driver model. Don't write a driver that initializes your hardware and starts providing services without going through probing. Don't do stuff in your module in it. Do everything only in your probes. Only thing your module in it should do is register your driver. Um, other ways, firmware dev link can't enforce ordering. It's all based on enforcing ordering between devices. Um, so like if you're directly parsing a device tree node to do something, it's bad. 
make it a proper platform device, I square C device, whatever bus device it is, or driver. Um, so you, there's a lot of examples of usage, usage of OF declare, clock OF declare, IR chip declare, timer OF declare. Almost 90% of them are wrong. You shouldn't be doing that if you want to use firmware doubling. If you have those, all the nice features I talked about before is not going to work for your system. You can't do parallelized booting. You can't do parallelized suspend resume. All of those things won't work. The only real valid users of these macros are everything that's needed for the scheduler ticks to work. So the, the root IRQ, because you need sched IPIs for that uh, each CPU. For that, it's okay to use IRQ chip declare. Clock off declare is for any clock feeding the scheduler timer and timer of declare for the sked timer. Those are the only really valid use cases for them. Everything else, please don't do it. If you already have your driver like that, go change it. All of them can be made into proper platform devices or <coughs> whatever bus type. Um, so that's one important way to kind of make good use of firmware doubling. Uh, yeah. So create a de uh, an obstruct device for a device at probably. The other one, this might be less partly controversial, but, um, oh, sorry, that's the next slide. Uh, this one is basically saying, if you're creating a struct device out of, from a device node, set the OF node for your device. Basically, it's an API called set device set node, use that API so that if you create a device out of a firmware node slash DT node, you set it up so that firmware doubling knows that's what's happening and can start enforcing uh, dependencies. Uh, one note, and I'll get to this later on for now, do this only for devices that you add to a bus. If it's a device that you're adding to a class, if you currently don't set O of node, that's probably a good thing. Leave it alone. I'll get to a while later on. Um, and then when you're creating a um, device out of a device node, create only one struct device from a device node. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've seen some cases where somebody's like, oh, this IP block supports, I'm just kind of making up an example. Like, oh, it supports power domains and clocks, so I'll create two different struct devices and probe them with two different drivers, and they both point to the same device tree node. If you do that, firmware devlink has no idea of like which device is the actual supplier. And most of the cases, there's no meaning, to, like no reason to do that. You can have one driver for that platform device that registers the power domain to the power domain framework and registers the clock with the clock framework. But if it's truly independent IP blocks, then try to, when you come up with the DT binding, try to come up with two different nodes where maybe one of them is a child node of the other, or maybe they're independent nodes. Um, so try not to create multiple devices from one DT node. If you have the mapping one-to-one, -one, it's better for firmware doubling. There's always an exception and maybe corner cases where it's valid, but they are really um, unlikely, I guess. Yeah, I think I covered it. Uh, the other one, this is again mostly for framework developers. I call it the bus or not the bus. Um, so before I get into that, uh, I'll kind of give some context. So every struct device that's created in the kernel either needs to be part of a class or part of a bus. And you can think of bus as a communication protocol. So think I2C, USB, PCIe, and then platform devices are like MMIO, memory mapped IO. They are all based on how you talk to a device. Um, and every device will have very distinct feature, right? You can you can have a camera or a touch screen on I square C. They they have like nothing in relation to each other. So every one of these devices will have their own drivers. That's kind of how bus devices work. So when you add a bus device, the corresponding driver will probe the device and give the functionality. Uh, class is more like a logical collection of similar devices. So GPUs would be a class, for example, or Ethernet. Um, something happened here. Um, LED regulators, they're all kind of class devices because they are all the similar type within that class. In those cases, you just add a device and you implement common operations for the devices in a class. So all regulators will implement a function to turn it on and off, set the voltage, stuff like that. Uh, so the, anyway, going to that, with that context, the main thing is if you're a framework developer, 
don't use struct bus if you never plan to probe your probe the devices you add. Because there are some examples of frameworks that use uh, struct bus and they add devices to it and they never probe. And firmware devlink points to one of the suppliers, it waits indefinitely because the supplier never probes, the consumer never probes. The only time they end up probing is if you have a deferred probe time on. Uh, we have had hacks in different places to kind of work around existing uh, uses of these, but we should definitely not be doing this in the future. Um, okay. The other way to make sure firmware devlink works correctly for your board is, um, oh, by the way, on the right side is an example from a real device of dependencies. Uh, this is, I think, actually kind of simplified. So in this case, basically A, B, C, D, and E, they have all kinds of cycles between themselves. You can pretty much go from one node to another following the arrows. So firmware devlink doesn't enforce any dependency between them because it has no idea of knowing, hey, I don't know which one is supposed to probe first because they keep telling me they depend on each other. But firmware devlink will still enforce ordering between, say, X and A. So it'll make sure A probes first before X probes because there's no cycle between them. And Y probes for, uh, E probes first before Y. So that's what firmware devlink does by default if there's a cycle. Um, but in reality, there's no cyclic dependency. Like there, there can never be a cyclic dependency on probing, then none, neither of them will probe. There's, in reality, there's no cyclic dependency in suspend, then you cannot suspend your system, right? So one of these uh, links in a cycle is probably like a link that you only need after you finish initializing the device. Um, so we have a new property in binding in DT where you can kind of point and say, hey, A doesn't really depend on B. It's a post-initialization dependency. So when you do that, then firmware devlink can realize, oh, A and B don't have a cycle, and it'll actually start enforcing the proper uh, ordering between those devices. So in your logs, if you start seeing cycles being reported by firmware devlink, you probably want to start adding the post standard suppliers property to your DT so that firmware devlink can do a better job of uh, enforcing the ordering. So use that, you know, that's one way. So those are all kind of the um, things people should continue doing to make good use of firmware devlink. And then there are some things that we still have work left to do. One key one is firmware devlink only works for devices, uh, board using device tree and there's no ACP support. So if anybody, I'm sure ACP has some amount of dependency information that it can extract from ACPI, but I have zero experience with it. So if anybody here knows about ACPI and wants to help, I'd be happy to work with them. We can slowly start adding, you know, like we added one property at a time all the way to 33. We can start somewhere simple. So message me or email me if you want to help there. Um, the other one is device links don't work correctly with uh, class devices. That's why in an earlier slide I said when you create a device, set the off node per dude only for bus devices. Um, so managed device links are device links that enforce probe ordering, suspend receive ordering, all those things. Uh, but if you have a supplier that's a class device, it's going to wait indefinitely for the device to probe and it doesn't ever probe. So device links don't work correctly. Um, so what we really need to do in that instance is we need to treat the addition and removal of class devices as in a similar way to how it treats probing and unbinding. So there's some work that needs to be done there. Uh, once it's done, that limitation will go away and things will work a lot better. That's also one of the things that's kind of blocking uh, me from adding support for sync state support for regulators, which is the next point. Uh, Ulf is working on adding sync state support for power domains, so you no longer have to worry about which power domains get turned off when or when to keep it on. Those things should work automatically. Um, I've talked with him to figure out the proper design, and he's like, I think, halfway through it. Um, uh, like I mentioned before, I'm supposed to do the stuff for clock. Again, I'll try to get to it as soon as I can. I uh, definitely want to get to it. And yeah, regulators is blocked on the class stuff, so after that's done, then we can work on regulators. And, but interconnect is the only framework right now that actually supports it properly upstream. Uh, and yeah, 
another known issue is that, like I said before, if one device tree node has two devices created out of it, firmware doubling has no idea which is the actual supplier, so it just picks the first one. Most cases it's right, but just like a few weeks ago, somebody reported a case where it's not the right one, and it's for SEMI. <laughs> so leave us here. <laughs> we don't have a lead. Microphone. Microphone. In case of SEMI, we don't have any uh, device node entry um, sometimes. So it is like, it depends on where it is used. For example, if it's a system uh, protocol which, sub, uh, which is used for systems shutdown or uh, use cases like that, we don't need an entry in device tree because it's automatically probed from the device and we expose the I'm, I don't have the full context and I'm not sure I can solve it here, but... I think this was more... It's oh. like a power domain thing. One is for the CPU, another is the power domain no, or something like that. I mean, like two different frameworks using the same protocol, and we create two different devices. But they both so point to the same device tree node. We should not actually they point do. to any device tree node. I think that is something... Maybe in one of them you shouldn't point to the device tree node. I don't know. But right, the issue was that two devices created from one DT node, like, they point so to the, the same... main question would be like, if it's only for the suspend and probing, do we need to create these devlings? These are the two main use cases. If the no, all the things I talked about before, they're all the use cases. So if the bus is, like SEMI has a bus, it can manage the ordering and the... No, no, not, you might do it within your bus. Even that I'm not fully sure. But th these are supplies on sitting on some other bus. Right, they have nothing in common with the CMI framework. Like you could have like a um, I2C device depending on something that CMI is exporting. Uh, like in case of CMI, what happens is those devices won't be created until the CMI framework itself is. No, no. Uh, what you're saying is true about the supplier. I think in that example for uh, I think it was like a platform device yes. that depend on a power domain that the CMI bus is exposing. You, you can't do anything, you can't fix this just within the CMI. There's no way to fix it, right? So right now, I, it's, it's a, because the first device that gets created, I think it's like a CPU free yes. kind of thing. So some, I don't know, I'm just making shit up now, but let's say I2C controller is waiting forever for the CPU device to probe, which is not gonna probe. Um, so this is the first case of the of first example that I've seen so far where just picking the first device that gets created happens to be wrong. Um, so I might have to add some hack there to say, if you set this flag, I'll never treat this device as a supplier it's for firmware doubling. Diff freak and CPU freak is the one I think it's being used basically. Mm. But so one thing you can do is if I add a flag like this, you could say, okay, this is a CPU kind of device. It'll never be a supplier, and you can set it for that device, and then firmware the link will ignore it. Yeah. But ideally, right, I would have preferred their separate device tree nodes. Yeah, like I'm still thinking whether we need to depend on these dev links or not use them at all. But yeah, we need to. <laughs> Think yeah, that because it, as you I said, think you'll have to if you it think depends more. on the yeah. consumer end. So. Yeah, exactly. And basically, if, to give more context, if you disable firmware doubling, GK won't work. You literally can't boot because a lot of no, like, all mean, the. Disable completely. I mean, like, don't uh, set the links. Today we do set explicitly in the SMI framework, but. Yeah. Can we deal with it without dev links is something okay. we need to And actually, that's the last uh, slide. So, any questions? Right. Um, you showed before that you added some new SysFS um, directories where you show the links. Mm -hmm. Any particular reason why you can't, like, we have something similar already in the block layer. We have this holders and slaves relationship, like, sorry, that's the name in the kernel, but like, it, it, it is this parent-child relationship already. Any particular reason why? It's not parent-child, right? It could, so it's, all, it's like a, it's not a tree, it's a graph. 
And yeah. the directory has all the edges listed, okay. basically. But you don't have any cycles in, in the graph. I don't have one? You don't have any cycles in the graph. I mean, you showed before that you can't, like, you don't support cycles. So it's a tree, no? Um, no, right? If you have more than one parent, it's not a tree anymore. And you still don't yes, have a cycle. Yes, okay, fair enough. But it, like, yeah, more than one parent is fine. That works with folders. And, like, it, we have that in, in the block layer. Like, if you have a... If you have like a device map, if you have like a complicated device mapper setup, you have underlaying devices, and then one parent can have multiple underlaying like if you have a rate, like a RAID, or you can have a child device that has multiple pieces on top. Like if you have partitions, so you, you kind of have that already in the block layer. Okay, but I, uh, what's the question? I mean, I was just wondering why, I mean, we have that already, why you're not, is there any particular reason you're, you're not reusing this all already? Like, we have this already, but, I mean, yeah. yeah. So. Mm, honest answer, I'm not familiar about the stuff you're talking about, but I, I would assume, unless you're, I mean, if it's, do you, do you support a graph there or no? You do? Oh, sort of. Okay. I mean... Yeah, it might actually be that we're not, it's not completely... Agreed. That, and also technically, we, I say we don't support cycles, but you still... Okay. There cannot be cycles for probe ordering and suspend receive ordering. Okay. But it does support cycles in terms of sync state. This is more of like a, we don't want to break things or when things are not clear how, how to handle it. So what it does is, again, <clears throat> like I said in the diagram, I said we'll figure out the cycles. And if it's a cycle, we don't enforce ordering. Okay. But we still know there's a cyclic dependency. And we still need to make sure the sync state callback I was talking about is still correct. So when you have A and B pointing to each other, okay. they'll both get the sync state after both of them have finished probing. So, so that way, if you're not sure, you'll still be functionally correct. So we, you you still you still model this graph with the cycle in your in your in your linking, okay? okay. Correct. Yeah. Only when you do probe ordering, we don't enforce it. Okay, fair the enough. The main place we need is for the sync state, the cycle. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Because uh, again, like it's common in clocks where you have two clock controllers, and like one clock will go from one to the another, and then get reordered back into the clock controller. And in those cases, you want to make sure both of them finish probing before you can turn off the clocks in the chain. Okay. So we still support cycles. Any other questions? Oh, there's one more. Uh, I read somewhere, I'm not sure if it's this talk, that you are intending to do like a probe on demand. So. Probe on demand? Talk. What do you mean by that? Okay. I don't think it's me, but I'm still curious to know. We can talk. Okay, I will look it up and uh, ask you about it. So uh, it was interesting to me because, uh, yeah, it's a much uh, less complicated uh, device uh, driver model, but in Bearbox we do probe on demand. We do not try to order a graph, but because we do not have modules, so we just probe recursively everything we hit. So if you have a regulator get, we probe the regulator. If you have a clock get, we probe the clock, uh, and so on. And I hope that the stack doesn't run out, but that's usually... So important. what is that? What is the different operating system you said? Uh, it's a bootloader. A oh, bootloader. Oh, okay. yeah, so it makes the booting a bit quicker. Oh, okay. But I read somewhere that you were considering. Uh, I don't think it was uh, me, okay, but I, mm, it. Or, I read yeah. something from on demand. Mm, I'm not doing any on demand stuff. So Understood. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's all I had. Thank you.